Thanks for hosting me. Um, I realize I should probably just cover my history for anyone who didn't know it. I, uh, I, I grew up in the 1980s programming in Logo. Uh, I learned how to do the triangles. I, I learned how to do the turtles. Can I actually just get a show of hands? Who here pro has programmed in Logo? It's amazing. You know, I was at a, I was at a, I spoke at a business conference the other day. No one raised their hands. I said, okay, who here is programmed in Lisp? No one. I said, who here's heard of Lisp? No one. <laughs> and it's like, wow, it's just all R and Python these days. So yeah, um, yeah. So I, I grew up, uh, I grew up on Logo. Uh, in the '90s, I, uh, I, so I should, my wife and I, uh, who's here. Uh, uh, majored in computer science and we worked at Microsoft and I'm going to be talking a bit about that. And then after a couple of years at Microsoft, we came to Google. We were here and I was here in the 2000s and I worked on the uh, web mirror team, which was part of the part of the crawl back then. And um, because I was a little crazy, I decided to give it up and become a writer and critic and technologist. And this is sort of the result, my book. Um, and, uh, but it's really good to be back. This, I mean, we were on the fourth floor back then, and this brings back a lot of memories. So this is very, uh, this is, has a special meaning for me. So I was going to read uh, a couple sections that uh, hopefully are relevant to more computer-oriented computer -oriented people. Uh, but first, I won't, um, as proof of my bona fides, you may notice that it's called Bitwise, and uh, those are actual bitwise operators on the cover, something I made sure of so that people would say, no, I just didn't look in a, uh, I just didn't look in a library of computer terms and s pick one that sounded cool. The real discovery, though, was this bit of art by, um, by Richard McGuire. He's a cartoonist who, who does some New Yorker covers. And um, if you notice the pipe and the ampersand, those are indeed bitwise operators. And um, I was very happy to find that piece of art and, uh, and use it. Uh, so uh, the, the first part I'd like to speak about is, um, this is actually a, a tale of my time at Microsoft. And Bizarrely enough, we have someone here who was actually there at the time on the very same team. So uh, he can he can verify that I'm not embellishing this. Uh, and this this section is called uh, Chat Wars, and it begins with a uh, with a quote from Grace Hopper: uh, "It's easier to ask forgiveness than it is to get permission." And now you'll see why. <laughs> At 22, when I was just out of college and still a green software engineer, I fought America Online and AOL One. The battle made the front page of the New York Times. The public was beginning to care about code. This wasn't the code that would crack the secrets of mathematics or the nature of the universe, but it was the lifeblood of our economy and society. It was the summer of 1999, and people were starting to realize that the internet and the web were becoming a new dynamic circulatory system for information, coordination, and life itself. The summer before my final year of college, I interned as a software engineer at Microsoft in Redmond. I was assigned to the group that was building MSN Messenger Service, Microsoft's instant messaging app. And after receiving my degree, I went on to join them full time. The unwieldy name was cooked up by Microsoft's marketing department, which had a reputation for always picking the clunkiest and least imaginative product names. Buddy list, see you, see me, MSN Messenger. No, it was MSN Messenger Service, but I'll call it Messenger for short. At the time, the big players in instant messaging were AOL Instant Messenger, Yahoo, and ICQ. Uh, AOL Instant Messenger, AIM for short, had tens of millions of users. AOL had become the country's biggest dial-up provider in the mid-90s by blitzing mailboxes with CD-ROMs, and all AOL users automatically became AIM users. Yahoo and ICQ each had millions of users. These are paltry numbers by the standards of 2018, but they were meaningful in the 90s. After my team finished developing the client code, we had some downtime while waiting for the server team to finish their Hotmail integration. We couldn't release without their work. We fixed every bug we could find. One of the problems was getting new users to join Messenger when so many people already used other chat programs. Um, unlike email, email, which has the standard SMTP format across all programs. These chat work networks didn't talk to each other. AOL didn't talk to Yahoo, which didn't talk to ICQ, and none of them would talk to us. 
AOL had the largest user base, so we discussed the possibility of adding code to allow Messenger to log in to two servers simultaneously, Microsoft's and AOL's, so that users could see their Messenger and AIM buddies on a single list and talk to AIM buddies via Messenger. We called it Interop. Uh, AIM's protocol was known as OSCAR, uh, stood for acronym for Open System for Communication in Real Time. Uh, it was undocumented. Uh, so uh, me and my mentor at the time signed up for AIM accounts and watched the AIM client talk to the server using a network monitor. I saw the protocol that AIM was using. My mentor Chris had figured out a large chunk of Oscar this way, and after he left the team, I picked up his work and finished the job. Um, um, so, you know, did AOL notice that there were some odd messages heading their way from Redmond? Probably not. They had tens of millions of users, and we were you know, mimicking their protocol reasonably well. But I thought this little stunt would be deemed too dubious and excised from Messenger before it shipped, but management liked it. So on July 22, 1999, Microsoft entered the chat markets with MSN Messenger service, uh, complete with AOL Interop. No one had warned AOL of our gambit, and they weren't happy with what we termed our, uh, with what we termed our unauthorized interoperability. Quickly, they blocked Messenger from connecting to their servers by veering their protocol messages in ways we hadn't anticipated. Users who tried to contact their AIM buddies from Messenger would receive a pop-up instant message saying, use an authorized AOL client at this link with the URL. But as long as Messenger sent exactly the same protocol messages to the AOL servers, AOL wouldn't be able to detect that a user was on Messenger. So I took the AIM client and meticulously checked for differences in what it was sending, and then changed our client to mimic it once again. Messenger users received an upgrade with this new fix, and because this was the dial-up days, uh, the fix, uh, the client was tiny. It was literally 300K. It was not even a megabyte. But AOL again caught on and switched their protocol up. We matched their client again, pushed out another upgrade. We went back and forth at least a dozen times. At one point, AOL sneakily excluded users logging on from Microsoft headquarters uh, IPs from their changes so that we would be unaware that either Messenger users were receiving an error message. <laughs> After an hour or two of scratching our heads, a team member sick at home notified us that, yes, she was getting disconnected. And a shout out to Kara for, for doing that amazing work <laughs> when we were all going crazy. Uh, Microsoft and AOL were both tech titans in 1999. Soon the press got a hold of the story. On July 24th, the New York Times printed, in cyberspace, rivals skirmish over messaging. AOL kept blocking us, wrote, wrote the paper of record. Quote, but Microsoft refused to roll over. Late Friday, the software giant said it had revised its MSN Messenger program to circumvent America Online's roadblock. Within hours, America Online answered that challenge with a new block. It was like reading about a wrestling match in which I was the mysterious mass challenge. <laughs> OK, so uh, another quote. This is from the great 20th century um, polymath uh, uh, Jacob Bronowski. Uh, progress is the exploration of our own error. And I think anyone who's been a software engineer sure knows that. Um, so the messenger war was a rush. Climbing in to work every morning to see whether the client still worked with AOL was thrilling, even if it usually wasn't. Um, when it wasn't working, I looked through the reams of protocol messages to figure out what had changed, fix the client, try to get an update out the same day. Uh, I had no idea who my adversaries were, but I'd been challenged and I wanted to win. And our users cared too, and they wanted us to win. And this was, you know, having actual users on your side at Microsoft in those days was actually somewhat unusual. <laughs> so AOL tried different tactics. At one point, uh, I thought that they ident were identifying the Microsoft client because it wasn't downloading the advertising that the AOL client downloaded. So I updated our client to download it all and throw it away. <laughs> AOL included mysterious protocol messages that didn't seem to affect their client, but broke ours, so I fixed that. One day, I came in to see this embedded in the messages from the AOL server. Hi, dash, Mark. It was a little missive from engineer to engineer, hidden from the corporate media and PR worlds that were arguing over us. Uh, I felt solidarity with him, even though we were on opposing sides. Uh, in the press, AOL was pushing pop propaganda about how Microsoft was behaving like an evil hacker by asking for AOL passwords. Um, uh, but this wasn't true, but we were allowed only to respond through the PR department. My team was sealed off, but our code wasn't. And then one day, AOL stopped blocking us. It was strange to encounter sudden silence as the enemy had abruptly yielded the battlefield. And while I wanted to believe we'd won, I suspected AOL would, wouldn't give up without a word. And a week later, 
we found that Messenger had been blocked again, but this time was different. The OAL server was sending a huge chunk of new gobbledygook gook that I could not understand, and it looked like this. The first couple lines are, are the standard AOL protocol header, the 2A0277C. This is all fairly standard stuff. Um, but from these 90, 90, 90, 90 onward, uh, it was incomprehensible. And it wasn't, didn't bear any relation to anything the AOL servers attempt their client or ours. The vast expanse of double zeros in the middle was also mysterious, since a bunch of zeros couldn't contain much meaning. Um, our client ignored it, but the AOL client responded to this gobbledygook with a shorter version of the same gobbledygook. I didn't know what it was, and it was maddening. After staring at it for half a day, I went over to Jonathan, a brilliant server engineer on our team, and asked what he thought. And he looked at it for a few minutes, and he said, this is code. Uh, specifically, well, that's code. Actually, most of it's code, but the most important part is down here, as you might guess. It was actual x86 assembly code. Um, the repeated 90s had tipped them off because they signify a no-op instruction x86 assembler telling the processor to do nothing for one cycle. So the pieces came together. Normally, protocol messages read as data, not as cold, but uh, AOL's client had a security bug in it. It had a buffer overflow in it. Um, and actually, let me ask, how many people know what a buffer overflow is? I'm going to skip over everyone. We're going to skip over that. Actually, for all the viewers in TV land, it basically means that they don't, um, is that you can run over the edge of, a, of, a, of, a, uh, of an assigned spot in memory and uh, overwrite the program code uh, with whatever you want. So they were overwriting it with x86 assembler. and the. Uh, and they were controlling the function of the AOL client. It's a huge security call, call uh, since uh, and AOL knew about this bug in their program, and now they were exploiting it. The double zeros were filling up space in the program's buffer, and once it hit the end of the buffer, it uh, overwrote the executable code with the remainder of the protocol message. The, uh, this is the new code, which uh, caused the client to look up a particular configurable address in memory and send it back to the server. And this was tricky, and much trickier than anything they'd done so far. And it was a bit outside the realm of fair play, hacking into their own client using an unfixed security hole, a hole that our client did not possess. <laughs> it was a uh, Rommel, you magnificent bastard moment, and I was out of my depth. Uh, someone else at Microsoft, I never found out who, told the press about the buffer overflow, figuring that if people knew that the AOL client had a huge security hole in it, AOL would be forced to patch their client and would no longer be able to exploit it. So according to the security expert Richard M. Smith, a certain Phil Bucking of Bucking Consulting sent him an email alerting him to the buffer overflow in the AOL client. Dear Mr. Smith, I am a developer who has been working on a revolutionary new instant messaging client that should be released later this year. Because of that, I have followed with interest the battle between AOL and Microsoft and have been trying to understand exactly what AOL is doing to block Microsoft and how Microsoft is getting around the blocks. Up until very recently, it's been pretty standard stuff, but now I fear AOL has gone too far. It appears that the AIM client has a buffer overflow bug. By itself, this may not be the end of the world, as Microsoft has surely had its share. <laughs> yes, yes. But AOL is now exploiting their own buffer overflow bug to help its efforts to block MSN Instant Messenger. Um, so um, it's a bit ham-fisted, I think. The developer of a revolutionary new app takes sides in the Microsoft AOL war without promoting his own app. Um, the email also includes a tr this, this actual trace. This is from the email because uh, I don't have my notes from it anymore because those were confidential, but I can still have that. Um, and if Phil Bucking's text and his name weren't suspicious enough, he'd also sent the message uh, from one of Microsoft's computers at a Microsoft IP. <laughs> the IP address showed up in the email headers and Microsoft's digital fingerprints were all over the email. Smith accused Microsoft of sending the email, and Microsoft fessed up. The news story that emerged covered Microsoft's attempt to badmouth AOL under a fake identity, an easier sell than explaining the buffer overflow. People on various security forums ascertained that the buffer overflow was real and invade further against AOL, but the press wasn't paying attention. The buffer overflow persisted into several later versions of AOL's client. AOL never admitted a thing, and the press never did understand it. 
So we gave up, and I licked my wounds, and I joined the server team. The, uh, the larger lesson of the, of the messenger war was that the workings of code were no longer a private matter known only to those steeped in the lore of computing. They were increasingly becoming public affairs that impacted national and even global events. And you know, certainly coming in the wake of Cambridge Analytica, um, <laughs> it proved more true than even when I read this. They were, um, the chat wars were, to me, a duel between a handful of people within two gargantuan companies, and yet they became a national news story for a brief period. Uh, looking back, it was the first inkling I had that it wasn't just computers that were permeating all our lives, but the code itself. And yet, few grasp code's function and its impact, something that is still true today. The ultimate outcome of the conflict resulted from a buffer overflow whose existence was never agreed upon um, because neither reporters nor the public understood it. So sometime after I left Microsoft, I met one of the AOL engineers who'd worked against me. We had a huge laugh over it, and I complimented him on the genius of the buffer over Roman exploit, even as I uh, bemoaned my loss. It had been a great game, I said, and he agreed. We were both dumbstruck that we were still to a very small number of people who knew the real story after all of these years. So um, that is, that's the buffer overflow story. Um, I'd like the, the second section. Uh, I, I, is, uh, okay, if you can hold your questions to the end, uh, I was going to read two more short segments that uh, relate to, well, the fact that the book goes all over the place. Um, how many of you know Dwar Dwarf Fortress, by the way? Just a couple. Okay, I'm not going to be speaking about that today, although I did, I did think about talking about it. But I, I discussed that in the book because I think it's a good example of how computers can and cannot model the world. So um, this is a section called uh, Truth Tellers and Liars. Um, it begins with a Charles Sanders Peirce quote, all that logic warrants is a hope and not a belief. So uh, there's a type of puzzle made most famous by the logician Raymond Smullyan and by the movie Labyrinth that involves liars and truth tellers. Uh, and how many of you know these sorts of liar, truth teller, logic puzzles? Yeah, okay. So let, let's skip over. Let's skip. Let, we'll just skip over that. Here's a. I'll just give you a variant that I gave to my daughter. Uh, let's say we've got two doors, and behind one is a huge amount of money, and behind the other is a shark. Um, I decided that the lady or the tiger was a bit, uh, a, a bit of a relic from an earlier era, so I changed it to money or shark, which I thought was. Very, very contemporary. Okay, so the writing on the doors. On door one, the shark is in here. Door two, both doors are lying. Well, door two must be lying because it's impossible to truthfully say that you're a liar. So door one must be true or else door two would be telling the truth. The shark is behind door one and the money is behind door two. I uh, compulsively worked through hundreds of these as a kid. And uh, I was fortunate my mother stumbled on Smullyan's book, Alice in Puzzle Land. How many of you read Alice in Puzzle Land? At least a couple. I was going to say there's got to be at least a couple. Um, and that became my introduction to the field of Boolean logic uh, and liar truth teller puzzles and logical paradoxes. Um, Smullyan's use of Lewis Carroll suited the truth teller puzzles since uh, you know, Carroll had been a, a, a logician himself. And some of the puzzles in these books grew extraordinarily ornate, requiring multiple levels of inference. Uh, sometimes they didn't tell you what one or another person had said. Sometimes yes and no were replaced with nonsense words like bal and da that meant yes or no, but you didn't know which. There were even abstruse puzzles that attempted to explain Kurt Gödel's incompleteness theorem, but uh, it was above my head uh, at that age. Uh, uh, but one puzzle genuinely irritated me, and this is a simplified version of it. So a man is trying to figure out which of two caskets contain a portrait. On the first portrait we have, the portrait is not in here. And on the second casket, it said, exactly one of these caskets is telling the truth. So where's the portrait? Well, whether or not the second casket is telling the truth, the first casket must not be. Um, because it says the portrait is not in here. Either the second casket is true and the first casket is therefore false, or the second casket is false and thus the first cas casket must be false as well, or else the second casket would be telling the truth. In the puzzle, the man also figures the portrait is in the first casket. He opens it up and finds nothing. The portrait's in the second casket. He's utterly baffled, and so was I. And the answer seemed indisputable. It was a very simple puzzle. So here's what Smolian wrote as an explanation. Without any information given about the truth or falsity of any of these sentences, nor any information given about the relation of their truth values, the sentences could say anything and the object could be anywhere. Good heavens, I can take any number of caskets that I please and put an object in one of them and then write any inscriptions at all on the lids, and these sentences won't convey any information. 
I felt cheated. I felt that Smullyan had made an implicit promise that he would be providing logic puzzles that made sense. But, I grudgingly observed, the other puzzles explicitly claimed that the rules were being obeyed, and in this puzzle, there was no such guarantee. The lesson was that truth and falsity are not absolute, but relative to a context. Outside that context, statements lose sense and meaning. Without the guarantee that rules are being followed, we can never be sure that our reasoning is valid, and nowhere is that more true than in the logical and contextually isolated world of computers. So um, from there, I go on to talk about um, bits themselves. So, um, you know, bits are commonly represented by uh, the degree of voltage on, uh, in a transistor. And there's nothing true or false on circuit boards containing transistors. The binary is between the voltage being on or off. Uh, off isn't actually zero, as I made sure to say. But, um, and the binary isn't between true or false or even zero and one. No one is actually interested in whether gates output a voltage signal, except in as much as that signal represents something else. And what such signals represent in a computer is an abstract notion of logical truth and falsehood, which is a notion imposed by us. Truth and falsehood are conceptions that we apply to the presence or absence of a signal at a particular point on a circuit board. Um, the binary representation of truth is so ubiquitous that we chronically complete logical true-false and computational one-zero on-off binaries. A programming language permits me to have a Boolean variable, let's call it is this thing on, which can be either true or false. And the simplest representation and most common representation uh, would be to use zero for false and one for true. But what if with this numerical representation we run across a two or some other number that's not zero or one? We could declare those numbers to be meaningless, neither true nor false, but we don't want a trinary logic in which there are not two but three options, true, false, and meaningless. So in C, the convention is that zero is false and any other number is true. Um, this representation appeals to our common convention of equating truth with existence. Falsehood is nothing, absence, emptiness, zero. Truth is presence, validity, existence, anything other than zero, even a negative number. Um, for those of you who have used Microsoft's H results, you know that uh, it's reversed in that way, and zero is uh, actually uh, the standard success result, uh, something that uh, caused a lot of bugs when people just uh, used uh, the not sign on H, on H results, thinking that they were binary results. A programmer is, and I include myself in this, is conditioned to treat true and false as synonyms for one and zero, respectively. True and false become the two possible values for a single bit in a two-bit system, uh, in a two-value system. <laughs> but these trues and falses remain a purely formal convention, even though the words contain metaphysical weight within them. If I write God exists equals true, that obviously doesn't cause God to exist, nor does it cause the computer to think or believe that God exists. All it does is set a signal somewhere deep in the recesses of a computer's memory. That line of code, however, suggests more than just the changing of signal on a circuit board. Any meaning we assign to true and false uh, besides a signal's being on or off is interpretation. If I say God exists, I'm making a claim about the real world. When a program contains the statement God exists equal one, it merely indicates the alteration of a signal. Um, so computers don't understand the difference between true and false, nor do they understand what the concepts mean. And, if a computer is to gain any grasp on truth as we understand it, it will have to be someplace uh, other than in its bits. And um, another quote from Thomas Pynchon, uh, who claims truth, truth abandons. And there's a little historical context. The, the, the history of logic has long wrestled with the problem of getting that true to mean more than one or on. Uh, the problem of getting true to say something about the world. The difficulty started long before computers. We may think that we can patently tell the difference between a true and a false statement, but outside of logic puzzles, pinning down this distinction proves horrendously vexing to the point that both Western philosophers like Sextus Empiricus and Eastern philosophers like Nagarjuna questioned whether the truth of anything could be known. These concerns, which might seem like philosophical navel-gazing, became far more urgent once formal logic entered the picture. The great logician Alfred Tarski, uh, an influence on computer science and artificial intelligence, coined Convention T as a minimal criterion for the truth of a statement. Um, here are two examples of Convention T. Actually, how many of you know Convention T? Not too many, okay, logic's not in these days. All it is is you put a sentence in quotes like, the sky is blue. The sky is blue is true if and only if the sky is blue. I am a jelly donut is true if and only if I am a jelly donut. 
And uh, a great deal of philosophical ink has been spilled on Convention T, but I think uh, most people will agree that this criterion is not especially helpful as a practical guide to determining the truth of a statement. And yet, we may even despair at how little progress Convention T seems to make over Aristotle's definition uh, of over 2,000 years ago. To say, of what it's, to say of what is that it is not, or of what is not that it is, is false. While to say of what it is that it is, and of what is not that it is not, is true. Not so helpful. OK, yeah, but you know, whatever truth may be, we can conclude that in order to interact well with the world, computers must be able to distinguish between true and false in the same way as humans do. The inadequacies of logicians, of logicians attempts to collapse the uh, difference between a logical truth and a worldly truth have been made all too clear in the computing age. The mathematician and phenomenologist Giancarlo Rota put this bluntly. Mathematicians are therefore mystified by the spectacle of philosophers pretending to re-inject philosophical sense into the language of mathematical logic. The fake philosophical terminology of mathematical logic has misled philosophers into believing that mathematical logic deals with the truth in the philosophical sense. But this is a mistake. Mathematical logic deals not with the truth, but only with the game of truth. The snobbish symbol dropping found nowadays in philosophical papers raises eyebrows among mathematicians like someone paying his grocery bill with monopoly money. Um, Rhoda here echoes Plato's, who was one of the first to find that truth is a practical matter, a matter of action rather than a pure theoretical uh, abstraction. Uh, in Paul Friedlander's summary, uh, truth in Plato's system is always both reality of being and correctness of apprehension and assertion. Or in William James's words, truth happens to an idea. It becomes true, is made true by events. The troublesome gap is not between logic and language, but between logic and reality. Symbols and proofs cannot close that gap on their own. Finally, three quotes. One, uh, Tarn Adams is actually the author of Dwarf Fortress. You activate bugs and little parts of the code from eight, six years ago where you di just didn't balance the numbers because it didn't matter. And the great computer scientist, Alan Perlis, every program is a part of some other program and rarely fits, something that everyone in this room, I'm sure, already knows. And finally, um, this is my daughter. Uh, and this is something she, this is a song she wrote, which I think uh, sums it up better than me. And errors can happen to you and computers because you are a computer. Go and do it. Program yourself. Just do it. Explore your toes, explore your nose, explore everything you have goes. And if you don't want to do that, you can't even live, not even houses, because houses are us. All right, that is what I wanted to end on. Thank you. I've thought a lot uh, in my life about how um, a deep understanding of computer science shapes my worldview and makes me think of the world in computational terms. and at at the same time, I've thought a lot about how, kind of similarly to what you were saying, that that's insufficient to kind of um, bridge the gap between conscious reality or reality in general and you know physics and math and all of that. And I feel like in many ways, um, this computational way of thinking about the world is extremely useful and at the same time very clouding because it makes us overreach in the way that you were alluding to in, in your last piece. Um, I was just wondering whether you could elaborate on your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, this is something that I can speak about because I'm here, which is that one of the strangest things was that as a software engineer, I felt like I was surrounded by people who thought it was enough. <laughs> I thought there must be something wrong with me because everybody else seems so definite. And I, I feel like it's just not working for me. And honestly, a large part of the book is me trying to elaborate on why I was so dissatisfied with it, which is one of the reasons why I don't, you know, program full time anymore. And, you know, I had been, I was a lit geek from a young age and I like, you know, some of the, uh, some of the formal uh, experimental books like, uh, I, uh, there's a French author, Georges Perec, uh, who wrote a book called Life, a User's Manual, which is Donald Knuth's favorite novel. Um, and everything is sort of mathematically structured by all sorts of formal mechanisms. And it's beautiful. Um, and I found out, actually, in researching the book that um, 
Can, uh, Perec had been writing another project in which he needed a 12 by 12 Greco-Latin square in the late 60s, and there had been a paper written on computationally generating them because you know, he couldn't he couldn't make one by hand. And I think that was it Euclid or Euler who thought that there didn't ex even exist. Greco-Latin squares beyond a certain single digit size. Um, but someone had written a paper on computationally generating them, and the co-author was Donald Knuth. So Perec wrote to Knuth back in the days before Knuth was quite the household name that he is today, and got a two 12 by 12 squares. So I, I love that point of connection, and that I think that was one of the things that helped um, keep me going and thinking, okay, there is there is room to try to to merge these two approaches because for many years I did feel like my mind was on two parallel tracks because I was doing some literature stuff in the background and then and then I was I, this was my job and I did and I enjoyed it a lot. But but each one I think felt incomplete and I didn't I couldn't see how to to sort of draw them together in any way. And for many years I did seem to be quite separate pieces because a lot of the literature and philosophy I studied was resolutely non-quantitative and even non-logical. Um, and as Giancarlo Rota points out, the attempts to integrate them were very ham-fisted. Um, there's, and that, that continues even to this day. One of the things I'm working on now is uh, Shakespearean authorship attribution using machine learning methods. And um, it's not, this is basically the plot of T statistics of words mapped against uh, frequencies. And because these machine learning models, uh, these, these were using decision trees, random forests, and um, a method called nearest shrunken centroid. Uh, but because the models were all opaque, um, uh, the, the internal results of the decision trees weren't presented. Or, uh, uh, I had to rip the models apart to sort of figure out, okay, actually, how is this attribution being made? And it seems like they were just being made on the basis of a handful of very popular words, like and is used very frequently by authors who aren't Shakespeare and is not used very frequently by Shakespeare comparatively you know, on a consistent basis. Um, but you know, if you don't actually have this breakdown, it can look very impressive. So. Um, uh, I, I think there's still a lack of, of good understanding as far as as far as how you draw these things together, and part of that is because of the the, the problems with semantic understanding that that computers still have. I was always something of a skeptic when it came to uh, semantic AI, good old-fashioned AI, and I guess I felt a little vindicated now that uh, the much uh, the, the you know, neural nets and and other um, supervised learning tech, sub symbolic techniques were sort of poo pooed in the late twentieth century and the mid twentieth century in particular, but once you have enough data, suddenly they they go way past anything that symbolic AI has accomplished. So that's sort of a rambling answer, and I guess the short answer is that yeah, I tr is that I treated at great length in the book. Um, would anyone else like to ask anything whatsoever? So the two excerpts you read were, one of them was very narrative and the other one was very uh, uh, word, uh, expos expository. And like, what's the balance that you were trying to strike here and like, what is the, the book like? Is it uh, a lot of n narrative structure? Is it a lot of exposition? Do you like munch them together? Yeah, well, hopefully, hopefully, hopefully they, they yeah, I, I skipped over the transition. Um, I tried to have it be both. I mean, I was encouraged, apparent, so it's an, I, I'm naturally sort of a top-down writer, so if I had just gone at it, it might, it might have been more directly philosophical, but, um, but a lot of people said, no, 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 David, you should make it more personal. And some of the stories are good, but I tried to, but there's plenty of the parts of my life that I left out because I thought they were completely boring or irrelevant. So to the extent that I talk about my life, it is always in the service of these, of, of the larger points. And uh, the balance is, I, I don't, um, it's hard to say, I, I, I don't know what the balance is. Would you say it's, is it 50-50? I, I guess my point, though, is that you know, having read books of both so sorts, I think that you actually do need both pieces. That um, I actually, I after 
after many years looking at politics, but also arguments of other forms, it does seem that stories are actually better at convincing people than, than arguments per se. And so crafting a narrative story that, that illustrates a point in a more concrete and visceral way can actually be more effective than you know, a deductive argument in which you argue from first principles because there's usually some assumption made in there or some prior, if you're Bayesian, uh, that if you don't agree on, um, you'll just say, nah, 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 this is, completely, this is completely invalid. I'm not gonna follow it. But you, know, you got a story and the thread of narrative is carrying you through. Um, so that's sort of my thinking about it. Hi. I was wondering if I could ask you about your process writing this book. I know you said in the Q&A how like, you ended up finding narrative themes that you might not have attended initially. Like, how, how is the process in general? Oh my god, you read, you read the Q&A, my god. OK, well, um, oh boy. Um, let, me, let me say something that, you, that, I, that I haven't already. Uh, the process. Um, well, actually, to return to the previous question, I, I, I did start off by writing some pretty theoretical stuff, and I think my editor sort of reacted with horror, saying mm -hmm. there was an entire, <laughs> there was an entire, so back in the day, I did compiler research. I, I loved working on compilers because it was like, it's like, oh, it puts everything together. And I, um, um, I had a chapter on compilers and compilers as illustrating the structure of abstraction layers and computers. That chapter got cut, uh, and it got replaced with a chapter on uh, my daughter. Um, and you know, uh, what can I say? Maybe it'll go into the next book. Uh, but uh, so it, it was. It was a matter of approximation, and it was a way of, you know, I, I had some existing pieces that I'd written. Um, there's one in particular called "The Stupidity of Computers" for n plus one. That, that I think did provide the germ for this. And I, what I set out wanting to do was to write something that uh, wasn't necessarily for um, a technical audience, although I tried very hard to make it so that a tech, someone technical would read it and say, OK, this person, this person speaks my language. Because whenever I'd, whenever I'd written for various venues, I would often speak to an, a software engineer there, and they would say, oh my god, I'm so glad you're writing for us. You actually understand computers. And I, this happened enough that I was like, OK, there's, 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 there's a gap here in terms of you know, people do not want to read another abstract critique of how the, the, the postmodern structure of computation is altering the sub nature of subjectivity in the, in the postmodern age, you know, something like that. Uh, you know, that, that. That being able to talk about this in which the particulars of the computer science matter is, I think, something that actually is very um, useful and helpful. And so, I, I, I try. I, I wanted to sort of communicate that tool set as well as some greater reflections on that tool set. Things that I didn't know when I even you know in college, but sort of had come to from thinking about them. Um, I say I, I, I was I was a columnist for some for some for Slate for some years, and one of the shockingly well, there were two column. Actually, there were three columns that I wrote that were incredibly surprisingly popular. One was on the amazing kids game, Robot Odyssey. How, how many people here ever played Robot Odyssey? The hardest computer game, it was, it was you, had to, you had to use logic gates to program robots. This was made for the Apple II in like 1984. It is the hardest computer game I ever played. I didn't solve it until I was in college because the, 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 what it asks you to do with logic gates is so damn abstract, and I didn't possess those skills back then. That one was a huge hit. A piece on Rocco's Basilisk was a huge hit, because everybody loves Rocco's Basilisk. And if you don't know about Rocco's Basilisk, you should look it up. And the third one was about Wittgenstein and philosophy of language, and how it related to computer science, and how it had helped me understand some of the things I was, I was talking about. And so and in some ways, those three pieces, uh, understanding that you know, computers were now touching everyday life, and that the best way of understanding this was to both have a grasp of bits, 
the, uh, the structures of computing as well as the larger picture of you know, what they meant in terms of everyday living was something that I wanted to communicate and then I thought I could hopefully have something useful to contribute on. I don't know, does that answer your question? Thanks for reading the Q&A. I think I also said that it was the hardest thing I'd ever done, and I still agree with that. It was, it was, it was not, uh, writing is hard. I don't recommend it to anyone who absolutely doesn't need to do it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Hi, thanks for coming. I look forward to reading the book. Thank you. Um, so I don't know if you answered this in the book, but there's been a lot of talk last few years about uh, teaching computational thinking to more and more people, or more simplistically, teaching programming to everyone. And I'm curious what you think, whether is this a good thing or is it being overhyped? I mean, I guess, it, I guess it can be both. There's always a hype, you know, there's always hype around something or other. It's like, you can say to some extent, oh, is, are, is teaching kids about big data, in, you know, a good thing or overhyped? Well, yes, it's good to know about those things, but the words big data may make you think, oh, well, let's not teach it like that. And I think that, I think, I think, I think everyone can certainly benefit from knowing how code works just in the way that I think they're going, people should, can benefit from knowing a bit about how machine learning models work and how they can and can't, and what they can and can't do. Um, at the same time, you know, marketing it as, oh, this is going to be of practical usage to you and, you know, you should definitely become a programmer or something like that, I, I don't think is necessary. I think that it would be better to propose this as, yes, this is fundamental knowledge in the same way that you know, mathematics is logic, having some base, even theoretical appreciation of what an algorithm is, how an algorithm can work. Maybe this is because I found this stuff really interesting. I don't know. We recently picked up a book for my seven-year-old, a mathematics book for a seven-year-old that was recommended to us by someone or other, and they said, yeah, yeah, this is great for like, you know, really getting your kid into math. And it was, it, it was written in LaTeX, and I said, okay, good sign. Um, but I started reading the problem, I was like, oh my god, this group theory for seven-year-olds, I, I was like, this is insane. I, uh, it's like, this is very impressive, but I literally, I'm, I'm, I, the number of kids who can absorb this level of abstraction because it was like, okay, well, let's say you have beads on a chain that alternate between these three types of beads. What is the 493rd bead? It's like for a seven-year-old. Uh, it's like, all right. Um, so I think it's a good thing. I think that unfortunately, especially ed tech being the way that it is, you know, there's reason to worry whether the right things are being taught. You know, if you just go, go, if you just teach people how to like design a clock and put it up on a screen, that, that's interesting. I mean, it will get you some appreciation, but, um, and use, but I think that, uh, I think that putting into context can be useful as well. Just as, you know, it, I mean, it, it would be as if you only did like, or arithmetic word problems in your entire time at school, you know, instead of going on to algebra and calculus. I don't know, does that answer your question? Yes. Uh, okay. You mentioned, uh, like, uh, you play, like, a logo uh, with Apple uh, before, and I wonder uh, what do you think about, like, this educational uh, programming things uh, we're going and uh, uh, what would be the future of the, of the logo or teaching? I don't know. I mean, I look at Scratch and I have such mixed feelings about it because on the one hand, it's great to have, you know, the notion of, of you know, imperative language and functional abstraction. Uh, uh, and, but on the other hand, it's like, but they aren't talking about recursion, you know, where the, you know, where, 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 I, 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 uh, uh, that that I, uh, I I feel like to some extent there's some I, I I do feel that you could introduce some of these concept some of the higher order concepts in a cool way earlier on but at the same time I, I uh, you know the fact that the kids are doing them is good and I've seen I mean I've seen other computer games I've seen other like kids games that 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 work on similar principles um, but. Uh, I, I, I think, uh, there, to some extent, uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to take the form of programming per se as, it, as much as it is a certain form of algorithmic abstraction. And it doesn't necessarily require programming so much as 
you know, learning the, the nature of how data structures and certain algorithms can, can fit together. And I, I'm saying that vaguely because I'm just thinking back to the various things I did when I was a, a kid that, that gave me an appreciation. You know, I think truth teller and logic puzzles are great as well. Uh, and there are probably other forms of puzzles that I haven't, um, that, uh, that I'd never have played that would be great as well. And I think that, um, well, we're all here at Google, but if some of us worked on trying to figure out what those are, that would be, that would be wonderful as well. Um, there was a puzzle game I played recently called uh, Steven's Sausage Roll. Do any, does anyone know it? It is the hardest puzzle game I've played in many, in many years, and I felt it training my brain quite well um, uh, in terms of, uh, I mean, it, it, you can see how it was very heavily influenced by abstract algebra, but it translates those concepts into, into, ap into applications within this game so that you aren't doing you know, purely abstract exercises, but you're actually executing it in a vaguely algorithmic manner. So I hope there's more of that, honestly. Um, I think there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, uh, certainly, you know, I look at, uh, actually it's interesting, you know, my daughter's learning chess and I feel like in some ways chess tutelage has been, has been developed very well because the levels of abstraction you treat in chess sort of go up that ladder like that and it's because you have such a, uh, an established context that, that it's helpful. So in some ways I would say that um, learning chess may actually be better for you than learning scratch. I don't know. In chess, he really, he really gets better. I mean, like he beats me in chess at this point. Yeah, I mean, there's a real, you know, what? I was six years old, and I had an Apple IIe with a monochrome moniker, monitor. But you know, here you have, you can draw shapes, and that was cool enough for me. I mean, and um, I have a short attention span and need lots of stimulation, so I don't think well, that kids would be would hate it today. I try to replace Scratch with JavaScript and explain, like to my son, how to draw these shapes and with JavaScript. Oh, you're yeah. just torturing him now. <laughs> he didn't seem very interested. So. <laughs> Sorry. He didn't seem that interested. Is that because it's JavaScript? <laughs> Try Python, at least, you know. Right. <laughs> or APL, maybe he'll like the cool little, like, you know, the, the symbols. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> like, I, so, like, if I had been introduced to JavaScript when I was six, I probably wouldn't be a programmer. <laughs> so. um, does someone else have a question back there? Peter, you must have a question. Sure, David. Yeah, that, and give me a hard time. Too much time. weight on logic and reason? Do I what? Worry that you put too much weight on logic and reason? Didn't I just criticize it? Well, <laughs> yes, but there was a lot, of, a, a lot of philosophy and logic in there. I mean, the, the background experience there is the discovery that winning an argument doesn't make you right. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, to some extent, I was hoping to play to this audience. I wouldn't have read that section to uh, to 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 uh, to an audience of lit majors. But this is presumably what folks here do all the time. And I, you know, maybe software, software engineers have changed, but I feel that the impulse to uh, to to quantify and regiment things logically is still pretty strong amongst. Uh, software engineers and other sorts of engineers and scientists. And so I think it's worth exploring. And I think that the stuff I talk about still underpins a lot of, uh, a lot of arguments. I think it even, you know, if you look at, you can see it, I, I guess, if I were talking to an audience of statisticians, I'd probably be talking about Bayesianism and frequentists. And, I, and you could come up and ask me, do you think you place too much emphasis on statistics? And it's like, well, you know, <laughs> it's everywhere. So I, the world may place too much emphasis on it, but. Do you think software engineers actually believe in truth in their programs? No, 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 I mean, that's, a, what do I think software engineers believe? I think that software engineers have a tendency towards reifying contingent categories as, uh, as literal and, uh, and permanent. Uh, for example, the, these, uh, these, these four 
like personality tests, you know, I, uh, you know, people, maybe people don't like, uh, maybe people don't go for Myers-Briggs, but, you know, apparently we subject a lot of people to classifying people into four colors, green, blue, gold, and orange. Uh, and apparently most people turn out to be greens. Uh, so if this is something that, you know, we all take seriously here at Google, I would say, well, I know you don't take it seriously, Peter, but would you argue that most people take it seriously here? Can't tell. Okay, my experience was that they do. Um. <laughs> it's easy to, to over, overweight what shows up on weird mail threads, or in fact, any mail thread, right? This is just from talking. What people believe. This was just talking to people. I mean, well, I didn't read mail threads when I was well, back it, here. <laughs> it seemed well, healthy. If this were a, a statistical group, we would argue about your sampling procedures, right? We could, but do you think you're putting too much emphasis on statistics? <laughs> no, I think that's the only way to truth. Well, as, so there you go. Uh, <laughs> uh, perhaps overweighing the, 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 the logical truth in that definition. Uh. Uh, I have what I think is a very relevant question. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk about what it's like to write for and be criticized by programmers on the internet. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll be honest and say people were actually really nice. I think, and this is this sort of reinforced I, that that a lot of the feedback was, oh my god, finally someone who knows about coding. So I would say, if anything, I was spoiled because I, I think that there's not a lot of technical knowledge on display, at least in the so-called popular press, or you know, uh, that. Um, that I wouldn't say I've gotten. I wouldn't say I've gotten a lot of uh, of flack, but in, in general, I think that if anything, I detected that there was a certain frustration. And I mean, this is frustration sort of getting writ large at this point because you have a larger cultural clash. And this is something that I've seen being involved in, like the New York writing scene, and how much resentment, or at least loathing there is towards the Silicon Valley and, and, and tech people of all stripes. And this can extend to an ontological critique that anyone in programming must therefore be a, an awful evil positivist, which again, yeah, Peter, you're right, they aren't. But you know, there are lots of big names who speak for technical companies who certainly qualify more on the positivist side of things. And there's a lot of, ang there's a lot of unjustified anger towards them, which I, th which I think is based in ignorance. I also think that, you know, yes, I, the, the, the worldview could do with some intelligent critiques rather than ignorant critiques that just cause them to double down and think that, that uh, that uh, you know may, you know maybe we should go back and uh, go back to Ayn Rand because she was because uh, she was right after all. Um, yeah. I don't know. Is that is how, how's that how's that for an answer? Uh, I mean, it's a culture clash. It, it really is. Um, but and I guess the thing is, is I have. I have an affection for both sides, I suppose, as well as frustration with um, perhaps closed-mindedness that, that occurs, of which you know I, I have my own uh, I have my, my own variants of it. You know, I'm, am I going to sit here and tell you that you should read Jacques Derrida? Hell no. Am I going to tell you that you should re sit here and read uh, um, I don't know Dennis Diderot? Yes. So <laughs> yeah. There's stuff to be gained, but unfortunately, what rises to the top is not always the best stuff. You mentioned that writing is very hard work, and you wouldn't recommend it to anyone. So do you plan to continue writing, and will it, will it be on a similar topic? Yeah, I have a problem. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you, you do it if you can't do anything else. And I mean, there's a Thomas Mann quote where he said, a writer is someone for whom writing is harder than it is for anyone else. And, I don't think I don't know that that's true for all writers, but it's certainly true for me. And um, I just, you know, it it's it scratches some itch, and you try to do it so that you hopefully are are serving some greater purpose with it. But um, 
that's the sort of question that can make you very, very self-conscious in a hurry. But I do plan to continue it. I'm writing a, uh, I'm writing a, a, a young adult novel right now to get a complete break from this because um, um, I didn't want to write about myself anymore. But yes, I have, I have more to say about computers, uh, <laughs> and hopefully that'll be that'll, that'll be incoming uh, in the short term. Well, what is short term? Oh, uh, like oh boy, no, knowing, li I mean, God, you know, life cycles of books are much slower, so it depends if, uh, how, next few years, I hope, I hope uh, sooner if, uh, if the publishing industry decides to, decides to speed up its, uh, its cycles, but, uh, I mean, there was like a year turnaround after finishing this before it actually, like, came out, so it's, uh, I, I do miss the, the, the rapid release cycles of, hey, I just coded this fix. Let's push it out. All right, good night. Um, if I could do that with a book, that'd be great. That's why I still, you know, I still blog sometimes, just because to be able to write something and actually put it out there for uh, for cons consumption the same day is amazing. And one of my most popular pieces in the last year actually went through that, and I had, which was my explanation of the finale of Twin Peaks: The Return which I wrote in a couple days, posted it. And apparently a lot of people really wanted answers because overnight I get like literally like 10,000 times more traffic than my little blog has ever seen before. <laughs> I watched like five episodes and then I felt like it doesn't make any sense. Like it's like horrible things. I didn't continue, but then I was curious. Like, what is going on? Like, what is going on? Um, I mean, what I always told people, look, if you're not enjoying it moment to moment, don't watch it. You won't, it's not worth it. But, uh, but I, at the end of it, I did want to know more. So anyway, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, it's been great. It's been fun. Um,